tomorrow we'll have a discussion session still. Just a reminder for those who want to play it. So today we're going to be trying to wrap things up to show you how these things we are teaching you actually relates to actually what we do in a lab and how we get data. So we're going to see a basic of a overview of a research paper and how we can take the information we get from the experiments in that research paper to come up with a conclusion that helps us then decide what to do next with respect to research or to, with respect to how to progress, whether it's a medical field or a non-medical field. So as you saw, this course is trying to integrate not just a part, but we're trying to let you think about the whole body as a whole. And it's really important to understand behavior as a whole, you know. He had to admit this year, he ate the last banana. Right. So, behavior, we stand off with behavior because behavior is more important than most people re realize. And, <laughs> you know, you know when you do your exam, the behavior that you all exhibit, right? <laughs> Animals also exhibit that same behavior. And, you know, some of us have other unique behavioral qualities. However, the learning objectives for this class include being able to understand what is the basic components of a research paper, what is meant by an individual motility assay, which we went through briefly before, a little bit more about something and specifically, and how do we use different experimental data to derive a conclusion? All right, so a uh, research paper generally has different categories. All of them will have an abstract, an introduction, a methods, a results, a discussion, acknowledgements, and references. Some may not have acknowledgements, all will have all of them. So this is one example of a paper. You have sending back of your article. You don't need to read this. You just need to understand the structure of it. That all of them will have a title. They will have an introduction. They will have uh, materials and methods or methods. Why do you think we need to have methods in a research paper? Yeah. Very good. So someone else can replicate it. If your research is sound or high quality, someone anywhere in the world can get the same result. And that's a big problem in science right now. A lot of drugs that are being put on the market are failing, and they found out when they go back to the original data, it's not replicable. They can't find that same result in other labs. So it's specific to one lab. Right? In some cases, it's data manipulation. In other cases, it's just accidents or mistakes. A buffer was made wrong or something was done wrong. On, we have another problem called contaminated cell. We derive a lot of information from cell culture. And sometimes when we culture those cells over years, the cells get infected with another culture that was cultured nearby. And it overtakes. Whichever one is dominant overtakes. NIH introduced last year, you have to validate your culture before you publish anything now from this year on to prevent that. Because we found that about 10% of publication had invalidated cultures. So they were getting data for a tissue that was not the correct tissue. So methods are critical for us to really replicate something. The details of the method is also important. When I was a postdoc, I tried for a month to replicate somebody else's experiment and couldn't get it done. So my PI, fortunately, had enough money to send me to the lab to learn how to do it. And I'm doing the assay, and the guy said, no, it wouldn't work. I said, why? Oh, you forgot to add calcium. I said, but it's not in your paper. He said, yeah, but everybody knows that. <laughs> add calcium, it works fine. They didn't put it in the paper. So, you know, there are many different ways of keeping your data private, but it shouldn't be like that. It should be where we try to help everyone. You will then have results. Results is the most important part of a paper. This is what makes a paper different from something else. This is what guides us to tell us that this is significant. Generally, when we get negative results, we can't publish it in a good journal because it doesn't advance the field. It told us that 
it's negative, it's not that important. However, recently there are journals now that publish only negative results. So that result can still be published and you can still see it in the database. So it's called the Journal of Negative Results. Original, isn't it? <laughs> so, then you have to have a discussion. So the discussion here, and the discussion is not just a reproduction of what you found in the result. It's generally an intellectual interpretation of that result and telling the field where you have moved the field. What is new about that? And then the conclusion is your summary. And then we have acknowledgement because no man is an island, or no woman is an island. We rely on other people for everything we do. Reagents, we don't make everything ourselves. So we generally, like when I write a paper in my lab, I generally have students read it, especially undergrads, and they see it from a fresh perspective, and sometimes they're unclear with a sentence. So it makes us rewrite it because we want to make sure someone even not in the field can understand what we are writing. So then you have another all-important area called references. Why are references important? Anybody? Yeah.
interact with them, we get better response than if you just send them an email. There's so many emails I could get to respond to by accident. So everybody has a role. So we're using this paper to teach you integration of concepts. So using your knowledge that you already have, right, we're going to explore this publication to see how we found something new about Trojan and I. So first of all, what is Trojan and I? You're all experts in Trojan and I. Yeah. It's the inhibitory troponin in the uh, CIT. Right, it's the inhibitory troponin in the CIT complex. Right? So what does the C-terminal of troponin I mean? Now you know already skip you, you did this. What does the C-terminal mean? The C-terminal just means that it's occurring at the C-terminal end. That is the primary sequence drawn as a linear marker and number one with the end terminal and the last amino acid, which is 210 for human troponin I, would be the C terminal amino acid. So N terminal is the first amino acid, the C terminal is the last amino acid, the C terminus is the last amino acid. So C terminal will be towards the C terminus. The N terminal will be towards the N terminus. So this first figure in the paper showed a sequence alignment. And if you look at the asterisk in that sequence alignment, it showed us that we are very similar at this C terminal. Cats, frogs, cows, you know, we are all very similar. Our troponin I is well conserved throughout history. So what does that tell us? It probably have a similar function. It's so well conserved. Now look at the only difference now is in chicken. And we always knew chicken was different, didn't we? <laughs> So, now, on the bottom there, that shows you the regions which are actually interacting. So, you don't need to know this. This is just to give you an idea of how to integrate data. So, there are different regions. For example, 32 to 79, that region of trophin I binds trophin C. We have a region that actually binds active weekly, 173 to 181. So, there are multiple different regions of trophin I that are interacting with other parts. There's even a region that's binding troponin T. So you see how the troponin T and I and C are well integrated. They all bind in each other. On in C, that is gel electrophoresis. So that is the protein that we purify in bacteria run on our gel to show us that it's correct molecular weight. So we make a troponin I, we make a troponin T, we make a troponin C, and we add them back together. We make this complex. And we run this to make sure stoichiometry is correct. What does stoichiometry mean? Correct. The ratio of each subunit. Because each subunit occurs at the same amount. So anyone wants to venture why troponin C shows up less even though it's the same amount? Because it's highly acidic and it binds the dye that we bind doesn't bind as well. So we have to use purified troponin C and titrate it and do a standard curve, and that tells us the actual amount. And each protein is like that. Each protein has different amino acids, and they bind dyes differently. So to do things properly, you have to do a standard curve. So remember, for every seven actin, how many troponins do you have? One. And a troponin means one troponin T, one troponin I, one troponin C. So now, we use some fancy techniques. One is called a mammalian two hybrid. This is a mammalian two hybrid system. Simply put, what it is, is two vectors where we insert our two proteins we're interested in knowing if they interact, and if they do interact, how strongly. So what do we do? We insert these two proteins, for example, troponin I and troponin T, or troponin I and troponin C, and we have attachments onto them now, we have other proteins. We have to verify that this doesn't affect the function. So we do that beforehand. So we try on different ends. So we make four of these, different combinations. Both N and T terminal, we can put these. We then find which two work better. Yes? Do we circle back the proteins? Yes. No, we circle the plasmids. 
plasmids are what you put into E. coli to make them grow, or you put them into any vector or cell to make them grow and produce the protein. So they have, just like how in our nucleus, we can activate transcription and the proteins, we're doing that here with these vectors. So these vectors are linear plasmids, which actually have their own um, transcription factors, etc. The key here is if you look below there, we have this GAL4 promoter. And when you have the two proteins interacting, it's going to activate that GAL4 to cause firefly to separate, to be active. So anyone has ever seen a firefly before? What do you notice in the back at night? It luminesces. So scientists took that information, we took the tails, drummed them up, and researched what was in there. And many years ago, a scientist came up, it's luminol, and made this for us to use in cells. So we do the same thing a firefly would do. And we can measure that luminescence to tell us. The more luminescence, the more interaction is happening. So we make use of this to tell us, one, if there's interaction, and two, how strong that interaction is. Everyone's following? So, if you look on the right, it tells you the same thing. It's causing expression of that firefly luciferase. So the firefly luciferase is not a protein until the protein <coughs> interacts. It causes DNA now to make that protein. So, this here is actual experiments we did in our lab. And this here is comparing the C terminal, what we did was we made many mutations. We truncated one amino acid from the C terminal. We truncated three amino acids and five amino acids. So if this is your C terminal, <coughs> and this is residue 210, this will be truncation one. This will be missing. This will be truncation three. This will be truncation five, missing five amino acids. So everything else is the same. The only difference we're doing is removing one amino acid from the C terminal, or three amino acids, or five amino acids. Why are we doing this? Because somebody 10, about five years ago said that the C terminal, the last 10 residues are not important for the eye function, right? And we find that hard to believe. Because if you have 10 um, amino acids, your body would have evolved over time to remove that, or at least change it. So there must be a reason for it. They just didn't do the proper assays. So we, we decided to check on this. So you can see here that there are differences between the different mutations. So if you look at A, can anyone tell me what they think is happening? the hydro luciferase. So this is telling us that the truncation is decreasing the affinity between the T and I and the T and C, or the T and I and the T and T. So it's telling us that that region was important for interaction. Because the wild type had better interaction. It has more luciferase. Now in this assay, it suggests that the delta one is not as important as the delta two and three. So it seems the missing the last three C terminal residues is very important for interaction between troponin I and troponin T, or between troponin I and troponin C. The C is actually controlled, whereby we do different things to make sure we're not getting a lot 
of luminescence when we don't have one or the other. And these are very important controls. Every experiment should have controls. Now, next, we can measure ATPase activity. And you all are all experts on ATPases, right? You know that we can measure ATPase activity. And we're measuring here myosin ATPase activity. So we're purifying myosin. And where do you think we get the myosin from? Humans? No, we typically get it from pig heart. Right here from UC Davis pigs. Right? So we isolate the myosin from pig hearts. And then we isolate the troponins that we have from E. coli. So these are recombinant in vein and they're human. And we get the actin from rabbits. Because rabbits make the best actin. Rabbits are so energetic. They're really great for actin. The pig actin don't work as well as rabbits. So we go to rabbits for actin. We combine them and we can actually measure the rate at which this is happening. And what we found is that it doesn't affect this rate. So it's not affecting the myosin ability to break down ATP. Number one, any questions, is that an activator? Right, so we can actually measure that in a lab, yes. Yes, yes, so in the species, some are faster, some are slower, so we try to match everything together. So this is what the actual structure of troponin looks like. You don't have to know this. It's just to show you that the troponin C, which is in red, is in a conformation like I showed you. It's more in a globular conformation rather than a linear conformation. And this is important for the actual interaction when the calcium bonds. And in this diagram, black is the calcium. So what we did was we took this troponin C and we added a fluorescent tag onto a cysteine. This fluorescent tag is IAANS. Why do you think we want to do this? Because we want to measure changes in the motion of this troponin C. We're interested in if the troponin I truncations are affecting troponin C movement. So, and we can test that now like this. So we vary the calcium concentration. PCA is the log of calcium. So. PCA8 is low calcium, PCA4 is high calcium. And this tells us only the delta 5 shows a very small change in the concentration of troponin C. So it has an effect, but not as much as we expected. So at this point, we're saying, man, that guy may have been right. He doesn't have that much function. It's affecting interaction, but physiologically, if the interaction don't translate into something else, it's not as important. <coughs> And here, because the interactions are weaker, we expect to see more differences. We are not. So we say, all right, it's not as important. But then we decided, let's go to a lab that's doing something that may show a difference. So we went there and we showed motility lab. So what they do is they take cover slits, small cover slits, and they coat it with myosin. And then they put actin with troponin on it. And they can vary troponin just like how we do. And here now, we can see the actin moving. How can we see this? We can see this because we fluorescently label the actin. So that's an actual experiment. Isn't it beautiful? So now we have computer software because we're not going to have a phone that grabs looking at this and trying to calculate how fast one of these move. So we have a computer program that measures how fast these things are moving over time. And we can do this now and take snapshots for every different mutation we do. And then we can measure the rate with different calciums. So it takes about three months to complete these experiments. And one person will at this full time for three months to get this next one figure. And this was the most important figure in the paper because it showed that the, all the mutations affected calcium sensitivity with respect to this motility assay. So the rate at which the cross bridges were actually forming were different between these things. And look at the huge difference there between the delta 5 and the wild type. I'll point it out here. This is the delta 5 and this is the wild type. More than half a log, huge difference in calcium. They're way more sensitive to calcium. 
Many things are mimicking if we had a hypertrophic adenomic mutation in them for disease mutations. So it told us that deleting those five residues was critical for the function of this in vitro motility. So the ability of myosin and actin to interact and move, just like we were talking about in class, was compromised just by removing just one amino acid at the C terminal. And even more compromised when we removed three amino acids. And when we removed five, it was disastrous. In our body, we wouldn't be able to survive with that. So it told us quite a lot. So, what do you think the hypothesis of this manuscript was? Anyone? Yeah. was, are the last five residues at the C terminal <coughs> critical for troponin I function? Right. Separately, what do you think the conclusion from this manuscript are? <laughs> yes, that's one. Yes, they are important. <laughs> but more specifically, you all are scientists here. Yes. <laughs> Not can't do, but yes. So the C terminal is critical, but five residues is more critical than three residues versus one residue with respect to um, cross um, function. What else? We also found that it affects interaction. So these mutations are also working at the level of interaction, right? But one thing that's very important here when we say about integration that you all uh, wouldn't know until you start thinking about it, is that when we looked at the IANS labeled troponin C, we saw very little change. When we looked at this system, the in vitro utility, we saw a lot of change. What do you think accounts for that? The IANS system was in troponin alone. In vitro motility is in the whole thick and thin filament. So what do you think the difference is? It means the mutations in troponin I are affected more than the thin filament. It's affected across the whole system. So the system changes that we're seeing when we do the in vitro motility, we don't see at the troponin level because it needs actin and tropomycin to bring about that problem. You understand how complex it gets? So that is what integration means, yes. Because changing amino acid can affect both ways. We're interested in, in getting um, more um, at that specific amino acid. Without it, what's happening? If you change it, it can be um, plus or minus because that region is also phosphorylated. Deletion, truncation. Uh, so, but the most common is missing. So, it's like one mutation. But it can happen through truncation. In fact, there's a truncation mutant at 198, so missing 12 amino acids, which causes hyperbaric adenomas. But as I said, we started this because someone needed 10 amino acids and it did call them chromatography and other, and said it has no function. It's not important. So, is this research important? If so, why? Why is this important? If someone presents, you have a kid, and we do, a, a, we do sequencing of the kid and find that the last amino acid of troponin I is missing, would we worry? No? <laughs> So this basic research allows us to translate it into knowing what happens when we actually see it at another level. So we know which patients, for example, if we found no differences, together with the other paper that found no differences, we would say that this is benign, which means that it doesn't have much consequence. So we tell the person, don't sweat it. 
take it easy, but your city should be fine. But when we see something like this, we tell them, I wouldn't want you to play uh, American football. Right? Because that's the major cause when people have mutations or stuff like this. That's what we see manifested. Jokes in. <laughs> All right. 